Howdy. I stumbled across this video and <laughs> I think it's very interesting. And I wanted to share it, or at least partially there is a much longer interview, like also available. I'm not through with that yet. That's a few minutes long and I just wanted to share a part of that because it probably has relations also to to other geological phenomena, let's say white rivers, mountain water or peat. But let's give a go and listen quickly to what Fletcher Prote has to say. When they first found petroleum, uh, because they were beginning to make motors and, and, and needed on axles of wheels on railroad trains and all that sort of thing. And remember, trains started in the beginning of the 19th century. Then oil went from a, just a lubricant to a fuel, and it made it valuable. And Rockefeller happened to be the smartest man in the business at the time. But he made a lot of most of his money, or much of it, off the transport of the petroleum as well as the selling it. But... <clears throat> One thing they realized was if you, because oil, uh, oil is, uh, putting a price on oil is like putting a price on a pail of water. You know, there, there's no, no initial cost is in the ground. And, and in those days, they were, some of it, almost what you'd call surface mining the oil. They didn't go down deep. So in order to get the price up, they hit on the idea that they would have to make it appear to be scarce. That, they, that boy, after we take the next few barrels out, we're probably going to have to close as well. You know, that kind of thing. But a very fortuitous event. In 1892, there was a convention in Geneva of scientists to determine what organic substances are. Well, the definition of organic is a substance with hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And so it's usually a living substance, a tree. You analyze a dead tree, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen and grass and so on, living things, animals, we are, hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. So at this Geneva Convention, Rockefeller took advantage of sending some scientists over who said, oil, petroleum, is hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Therefore, it must be derived from the, uh, the spoiling, the rotting, of formerly living matter and uh, playing the game properly when the this scientific convention was over they defined oil as a, a residue from formerly living matter well that makes it a fossil fuel i don't know why they decided to use the word fossil but it says formerly living matter it's fossil well of course today and, and and another thing we should know is that there has never been a fossil of a, a a real fossil found below 16,000 feet and you can't argue at 16,000 as a level line because someplace the ground sinks and so on but 16 is what the scientists say 16,000 we mine oil or we we drill for oil at 30,000 33,000 28,000 every day of the week so right there we rule it out that it isn't fossil fuel it's called fossil fuel for the minds of the public to feel that it is a, a, an asset that is running out being depleted we talk about depletion allowance which is a lot of you know and actually if you know the world's oil supply you know that it is not going to run out for an awfully long time it is the second most prevalent liquid on earth and, and we haven't begun to dig well with all that background you see the people in charge of the petroleum business for perfectly reasonable business uh things like any other man in a business wants to keep his price as high as he can get away with and the way to do is just say well there's no more we we we're the last barrel is going to cost a thousand dollars and it's all done and, and they preach that stuff. What bothers me is that, that in geology books, it's in there. The geologists say it's a fossil fuel. They, they've somehow they've been bought. I, mean, you, I, I went to a four-year federal staff energy seminar run by the government of the United States during the so-called 
energy crisis. I was the participant. Yes, energy crisis. And um, I was reading some other stuff. I'm still like, there's many things I'm every now and then reading. But so while watching this video, just first time or something, it made me think about uh, the glacial theory and the history of it. So I ended up on Cambridge University Press. Yeah, it's not an ending, it's just one station. The early history of, the, of glacial theory in British geology. Published online by Cambridge University Press. Abstract. It's rather long. So let me show you one interesting part. At this time also, many observations of changes of sea level relative to land were being made. Charles Luyel and Charles Darwin each presented many papers reporting evidence of sea level changes and both agreed on the probability of land movement to account for the relative change of level. The idea of marine deposition or drift was certainly supported by the popularity of ideas of recent emergence of the land. In February 1834, George Bellas Greenow, the president, reminded the Geological Society of London that among the subjects which for some years past engaged the thoughts geologists, none perhaps has excited so general and intense an interest as the theory of elevation. Yet there were many difficulties in explaining delivium or drift as a marine deposit, including its general lack of stratification, the angular character of many of the rock fragments, and the occurrence of huge erratic blocks of rock. In, in times these anomalies might have weakened the theory considerably, but two circumstances prevented this. At first, these problems were not clearly recognized, and to the extent to which they were, they could be resolved by assuming the agency of ocean currents due to rising mountains, earthquakes, volcanoes, and other paroxysmal events. Since relatively little was known about the ocean bottom, such hypotheses raised little opposition. The more important development was Leo's introduction of floating ice into the theory of marine deposition. The single modification, I argue, prevented the rapid acceptance of Agassiz's glacial theory and delayed for decades its achieving dominance. Luel, Lyell, argued for the role of floating ice in boulder transport in the first edition of his principles of his principles oh. there's a chicken sitting on my lap <laughs> well anyway relax on 19 February 1836, he reviewed and strengthened his idea in his presidential address to the Geological Society. Two weeks earlier, Murchison had discussed the drift deposits and had acknowledged that icebergs might be the verea cosea of erratic blocks. The fifth edition of the Principles offered a section entitled Effects of Ice in Removing Stone, 1837. In this passage, Leal explained first that rocks are more easily moved when ice adheres to them because of the lower density of the whole mass. Then he noted the amount of debris carried by glaciers and the moraines formed of the debris at the extremes of a glacier's movement. But he devoted most attention to the breaking off of ice icelands where glaciers descend to a shore and to the transport of rocks by such icebergs. Floating ice was even part of Leo's explanation of the transport of erratic blocks from the Alps to the Jura. 
Earthquakes, avalanches, spring thaws, the bursting of temporary natural dams and glaciers were also involved in, involved in his explanation. For which glaciers alone would have been sufficient, as Agassiz would later show. Hypotheses of iceberg transport of drift were also buttressed by the current interest in reports on northern Antarctic icebergs. Typical of this interest was a paper from Canada by Bayfield in 1836. The report was communicated to the Geological Society by Lyell himself. Many similar reports were published during this period, including the observations of Darwin, naturalist on Beagle, and of Captain J.G. Ross, discoverer of Victoria Land. These are the Alps. Now let's go somewhere where we have glaciers. Here are glaciers. There are three of them joining. They're getting more company from the side. And here. And the glacier. But I don't like that because there's it's just not good picture clarity. Let's search for some other glacier. Yeah, let's take this one. There is sedimentary stratification in the flow direction visible. I hope we agree that they flow in this direction. We have patterns which might indicate this. So, here they are joining, and we go down, and they are not white anymore. And here is the end of the glacier. And that's actually a very good example. Let's see if we have a picture of that place. Not really. But anyway, we don't need maybe more pictures. We have this one. And that's the end of the glacier. It just drops off. So the question remains, if these geological phenomena called glaciers are carving out all the valleys. There must be a huge pile somewhere laying around which is as big as the valley itself, approximately. So if we turn around from where we were at the glacier, this, isn't, this didn't really work. Obviously. Let's go down here. This is uphill. Now we turn 180 degrees. Go a little bit down and now we watch downhill. And probably have noticed there isn't any pile anywhere. There is even another lake here on the side. There might be a dam that they can produce water or keep the water calm that it doesn't come down all at once. And you can follow whatever valley you find, wherever on earth, 
wherever is a glacier. This is still the valley we are following. There's a lake. There's another lake. We can just follow that. And all of a sudden here, you can see fields. And I don't know exactly where we are, but it doesn't matter. This is rather flat. There are some hills around. But there is no pile. I just try to explain that probably also the glacial theory might be wrong. As is probably, or obviously, this fossil fuel thing wrong. Like, it's not that this would be something new to me, that it's not what it is. But I just found this interview and I found it really interesting because it, he tells it somehow so naturally. Because he obviously has been there and many of those places. So, there is not one single volcano in the Alps. And still I think glaciers might be contemporary lava streams made of water. Which means the glacial glacier carrying mountain might be a volcano after all cryptodomes and such but anyway i leave it here thanks